Ladies and gentlemen, the present lecture has been occasioned by two events. The foremost one is that I had the honor to receive the 2011 Bowlby Ainsworth Founder Award. This was the text of the laudation. And since I am well aware that keywords like control, system or model though receiving plenty of lip service, are still not yet very expertly coped with in attachment literature, I deem this to be a good occasion to give an introduction into the subject matter. The second event was an invitation to give a state-of-the-art lecture at last year's European Congress of Psychology, which unfortunately I had to cancel on short notice. It seemed only fair to offer those Congress participants who were interested in attending the lecture a chance to catch up or, for that matter, a chance to get even more than they had bargained for. As a matter of fact, making use of the advantages of a web-based presentation that allows the viewers to take a break any time at their own convenience, I have extended the original paper into a course of eight lectures, which affords me an opportunity to look at the topic under different perspectives, to spotlight crucial issues more thoroughly, and to render the presentation more comfortable to follow. Attachment theory has become a subject of increasing interest, and rightly so, since it appears to be the only entry gate through which some of the spirit of classical ethology had a chance to imbue and inspire psychology. I'm not speaking as much about adopting particular concepts like imprinting, but mainly about a way of thinking that had no tradition in academic psychology a heuristic attitude inspired by the following guidelines. Don't sacrifice biology to some nebulous concepts of socio-cultural circumstances that mysteriously resected man from his natural embedding and created him anew from scratch. Make use of the self-testimony of nature and don't believe that you only start being scientific when you manipulate your object in a way that looks sufficiently artificial. Proceed in a comparative mode, since only then will you recognize both what renders men unique in nature and what archaic forms continue to live on in him. When looking out for natural order, don't try to emulate physics, expecting to find symmetries and conservation laws, but rather, like a biologist, go for functionality. Don't be satisfied with a solely ultimate solution, but proceed to the proximate question by asking yourself what construction principles were in the reach of nature? What compromises did she have to make? Which side effects did she have to accept? And finally, describe these mechanisms in an appropriate, that is, in a systemic language. The lasting merit of the attachment approach is that it appreciated these requirements and contributed to make this way of thinking a little better acceptable among psychologists. Nevertheless, we have no reason to be entirely content with the state of affairs. There are drawbacks to be aware of. They are due to the fact that the attachment approach became a school 
before reaching the level of a theory. Let me briefly elaborate what this is supposed to mean. In a best-case scenario, a theory develops in the following mode. Someone comes up with a brilliant idea. The issues start getting around. Others take it up, upgrade it, embellish it, and the idea ripens into a theory. Empirical research blossoms and supports data that fit into the theoretical matrix and refine it. But it can also work out in another way. The idea comes under the regime of a fundamentalist orthodoxy that uh, sees suggestions from outside as endangering their interpretational sovereignty and consequently seals itself off from laymen that did not undergo the proper initializing ritual. Further conceptual development is then thwarted by a rigid exegesis of the canonical literature. Creative doubts are overrun by missionary bustle. The original idea fails to become refined and differentiated into a full-fledged theory and is only inflated in its embryonic shape in which, nevertheless, it is expected to become applicable in practice. Here, too, busy investigators may produce a downpour of empirical material, but there is never any solid meshwork to catch and to harbor it. Rather, it sinks through the protoplasm of a poorly structured conceptuality and, instead of clarifying anything, only contributes to increasing confusion. Psychoanalysis is still struggling to overcome this danger, and I think that attachment research should also be careful to avoid such a development. My present talk will focus on some of the areas in which the theory needs clarification or even correction and to point out ways that may remedy the defects. Let me start with a brief summary of attachment theory in its present state. Its history starts back in 1940 with a publication by an almost unknown ethologist stemming from a Jewish family in Krakow, but raised in Switzerland, who managed to become the first female zoo director in Europe. In order to acknowledge her work, it is necessary to go back to the year 1918, when an American zoologist by the name of Wallace Craig published a seminal paper with this title. His basic idea was as follows. Instinctive behavior is released by a problem situation, such as being hungry or threatened by a rival or a predator. It aims towards a situation in which the problem is solved. Craig saw that the resulting behavior falls into two sections. A first preparatory stage of high flexibility and a final rather stereotypical behavioral coordination. The first one he called appetite or appetence, the latter consummatory action. To release the consummatory action, uh, a cue is required, and the appetence is the search for this cue. Craig was already aware that this form of instinctive activity is not the only one. He distinguished a second type, which he called aversion. Here, the cue is not an indicator of the solution, but rather of the problem. 
There is no specific consummatory action. The solution is perceived as a consummatory situation. The aversive activity lasts until the cue is no longer sensed. Then came Conrad Lorenz. In a paper published in 1937, he considered Craig's distinction of appetites and aversions as an unnecessary complication, as can be seen on this marginal note on a reprint of Craig's article. It reads, how do you account for an appetite for a negative reaction, fleeing for instance? Is gregariousness an aversion or an appetite against solitude or for company? The distinction he deemed is only a matter of perspective. Every instinctive activity can be seen under both aspects. It is sufficient to subsume all instinctive activity under the scheme of appetence and consummatory action. This was the juncture where Monica Holzapfel entered the scene, who uh, had meanwhile married and extended her name to Maya Holzapfel, by the way. She published a paper titled Drive Intended Rest States as Goals of Appetites. And in this article she wrote, when we observe an animal in its appetence behavior, we automatically think, what will it do after finding its goal? So far, this question has caught the interest of scientists so strongly that the opposite question has remained almost entirely unnoticed. Aren't there also cases in which an animal instinctively searches for a stimulus situation in which it can cease being active? And how must the stimulus situation be furnished in order to release a rest state? She pointed out a third kind of cues that satisfy appetites without releasing consummatory actions, because they by themselves already indicate the solution of the problem. And the most prominent example she gave was the home as the place of relative security and, even more interesting, the individual with home character, such as the mother or the spouse. Lawrence was quite intrigued by this idea. He himself did not make much of it, but he passed it on to John Bowlby. The main vehicle for this transfer was the concept of imprinting. This was the birth hour of attachment theory. Let me briefly recapitulate its main statements. Attachment is being defined as a relation to reference persons that have become familiar by way of an imprinting-like process. It motivates behaviors that provide the proximity of these objects and occurs preferably when the subject is in a state of anxiety or stress. This motivation is interpreted as a primary drive, striving for a feeling of uh, security. These notions run counter to behaviorism where the child's affiliation to social objects is believed to derive from preceding reward. The reason for rejecting this explanation is that the child cannot wait until it has learned by trial and error whom she can trust and who is ready to devour her. Attachment is plausibly assumed to be cross-connected with other motives. Although the systemic structure of this interaction is not very clearly specified, the only comparably explicit statement concerns some kind of a balanced antagonism between attachment and exploratory behavior, which is sometimes illustrated by a well-meant, though rather awkward, mechanical model. Since about a decade ago, a third motivational dimension is being discussed under the label of autonomy. 
Without being formally incorporated into the theory, it is regarded as the fruit of a secure attachment relation. Finally, the notion of inner working models is worth mentioning. It refers to repeated experiences with attachment objects, mainly in early infancy, but also during later lifetime, that form a lasting frame of reference for perceiving one's place in the social environment and a repertoire of preferred social strategies. This is a rather seminal idea, but for attachment theory to become applicable in clinical work, it will have to offer some understanding of the processes in which working models are formed and, if necessary, restructured. To date, the only substantial contribution to this topic seems to be Mary Ainsworth's three uh, attachment patterns, which upon closer inspection are nothing but classes of working models. I shall return to them later in somewhat more detail. Incidentally, there is a fourth category, disorganized, which was introduced by Mary Main and her co-workers. I cannot help suspecting this concept to be sort of a trash category for phenomena that without doubt do exist, but nobody can make heads or tails of in terms of attachment theory proper. In spite of the suggestive choice of the fourth letter in the alphabet, I think that they can scarcely be regarded as a new member of the ABC group. But then my skepticism may well be due to a poor understanding of the concept, so I had better leave it out of this presentation. Well, so much for the content of attachment theory. But there is still another aspect to be considered which pertains to the format in which it is couched. In the middle of the last century, it became fashionable to abandon the physicalistic orientation of behaviorism in favor of a terminology adapted from control theory. It is only fair to credit a systemic view of the human mind to Sigmund Freud as well, particularly to his conception of a psychic apparatus and its so-called topographical structure. But then Freud's time was not yet ripe for the insight that physics is not the only model of natural science, particularly in the so-called dynamic and economic dimensions of his metapsychology, his theorizing was dominated by purely energetic notions such as force, conservation and inertia. Only cybernetics brought the breakthrough substituting information for energy as a conceptual tool for handling biological and psychological processes. Bowlby fell into line with this and started phrasing attachment theory in terms of feedback loops and similar concepts. Particularly popular was the term goal-corrected and, of course, system. Because of its intricacy, however, the cybernetic approach remained for a long while limited to purely verbal metaphors. As far as I can see, the computer program that we developed at the Max Planck Institute Seewiesen, Germany, and then refined at Caltech Pasadena and at the University of Zurich, Switzerland, seems to be the earliest, if not even the only, elaborate formalization of attachment theory. It became known as the Zurich model, and my present talk is meant to familiarize you with this approach. Formal theories cannot make do without mathematics, which is deterrent to many psychologists. I can reassure you that in the main section of my talk, we shall do without formulas and equations. However, by way of an introduction, 
I would just in this second chapter um, like to present an example that may give you a feeling for the way a systems analysis is performed. You may skip this chapter without harm if you want, but I wish you wouldn't. If this kind of reasoning lies outside of your expertise, don't bother to follow the mathematical steps in detail, but try to get an overall impression of the mode of thinking one has to adopt when seriously devoting oneself to this approach. I shall confine this excursion to an example concerning a rather simple behavioral problem. Attachment is a form of affiliative behavior, and the most primitive form of the letter is anonymous. It can, for instance, be investigated in many fish, such as young cichlids. Here is a view of our experimental setting. A fish tank with the water so low that all locomotion is virtually two-dimensional. The position of the animal is continuously recorded by a video camera. This is what the recording looks like. A computer program detects and locates the animals. In our experiments we worked only with two fish at a time. If we fixate one of them in a little glass bowl, the other one searches its proximity. This is a typical spatial distribution from an early recording. You may recognize a funny asymmetry here. It took us some time to realize that this was an artifact owing to an unbalanced positioning of the heater. From such a distribution, it is possible to compute the attractive force exerted by the companion in the bowl. In order to make this computation easier to explain, let's for a moment pretend that the distribution, instead of showing the positions of a single fish at different times, is a momentary snapshot of a very great number of free-swimming fish which are blind with respect to each other and only responding to the animal inside the bowl. The concentration, let's call it C, of all these animals distributes approximately like so over the distance x. Of course, all these specimens of the outside fish are not frozen in their momentary sight, but rather swimming back and forth. Now we select a single distance and count how many fish cross this border in one or the other direction. Since at the immediate left of this point there are more individuals than on the right side, the diffusion directed away from the target fish will be stronger, proportionally to the inclination of the tangent. Inclination is calculated by a differential quotient usually abbreviated as C prime. Now, if diffusion were the only effect, the process described would go on until equal distribution results and C prime would eventually everywhere equal zero. However, additionally, we have the appetitive force towards the reference fish. Let's call this force the momentum P. It acts on every single animal at the distance chosen, so the total attractive flow is P times C. In equilibrium, this flow and the diffusion must cancel each other, which yields this formula to compute the momentum P. So, if the concentration looks like this, the derivative function has roughly this shape. Let's quickly revive our high school mathematics. A derivative denotes the slope of a curve. So C prime is positive if C is ascending, negative if it's descending, and zero at the peak of the concentration. 
Here we have the quotient of both, which has to be mirrored on the abscissa in order to allow for the negative sign. So this is the momentum P. This momentum is appetent only at the right side of the peak. To the left side it becomes negative, so here it is an A version. This was the first step of our analysis. We have extracted from a spatial distribution the underlying motivational force. The next question is how this force is generated. At this juncture, we have to switch to a systemic depiction. Cybernetic systems analysis makes use of basically two iconic symbols, boxes that represent systems and arrows depicting variables. Systems establish a causal connection between variables, which in the ideal case can be expressed mathematically. The direction of the arrows indicates the causal order. An arrow pointing towards the box denotes a cause. An arrow pointing away from the system is an effect. In informatic language also the terms input and output are used. If one input acts on two separate outputs, this is symbolized by a branching symbol. The soldering joint denotes one and the same variable and is not to be read as if half of the quantity goes the upper way and the other half the lower. So far so good, but exactly what does causality mean? We should definitely understand that arrows are not to be interpreted temporally as if x comes before y or some entity flows along the arrows. The symbolism is not a flow diagram. This is not quite easy to understand, so I shall elaborate it a little. A variable is a process, a time function. What does this mean? Let's suppose the box describes a child's attachment system which prompts him to follow his mother. Mother's locomotion causes the child to follow. X and Y are the momentary positions of the actors. They can be appropriately quantified. Mother keeps moving, so her momentary position X is a function of time. When we depict time on the abscissa and the position on the ordinate, the time function of the maternal locomotion looks somewhat like this curve. The same holds true for the child. So we have to think of arrows in a block diagram not as static quantities but rather as processes. Their relationship cannot be described by a normal functional equation, instead it requires so-called differential equations which is a technicality that need not be understood in the present context. But what then is the real meaning of causality? Let's take a look at physics that is considered to be the classical science of natural causality. I can think of no physical law describing a direct causal connection of two events that occur at different moments. Instead, cause and effect are conceived of as simultaneous events. So, where did the flow of time go in the laws of physics? Well, it hides in differential derivatives like velocity or acceleration from where it can only be extracted by way of integration. But again, if causality is not to be interpreted temporally, how else can it be operationally defined? Here's the answer. If an external agent would manipulate the process X, which has to be 
documented by inserting another time function, this would normally require to replace y as well in order to be descriptive of the system's behavior. If, however, he directly manipulates y, x remains unchanged. So, in order to understand causality, we have to resort to the concept of manipulation. Causality does not refer to a temporal sequence. It specifies the direction in which determination is conveyed inside the system. Only with the help of this conceptualization can a feedback loop be understood, which implies, after all, that a process causally affects itself. Now let's turn to our fish. We regard it as a black box, taking the liberty to change black to lilac. The parlance just indicates that we start with no assumptions concerning its interior. In the following analysis, we shall then try to subdivide this box into a network of partial systems. The fish perceives its partner and moves its fins. Both activities form a closed loop. We shall subsequently depict directly observable processes in light blue and as opposed to inferred hypothetical constructs in black. The output of the motor system is the subject fish's location, while the input of its sensor is the distance of the object fish. Unless the object is confined in a small glass bowl, it is likely to keep changing its position. The distance is the difference of the two locations. In order to indicate this relation, we need a subtraction symbol. We use a yellow circle with a plus sign in it, combined with a little triangle denoting sign reversion, which turns addition into subtraction. Thus we come up with a negative feedback loop, which is the main issue in control theory. Now as to the inferables. We name them not after their physical quality, which as a rule is unknown to us, but rather we name them after the semantic information they convey. So what is the semantics of distance regulation? If just for convenience, we apply the language describing human infant behavior onto the fish, we might say it feels more secure next to the companion, of course without implying that this semantic is consciously experienced by the animal. The correlation is negative. Security increases with the inverse of distance, that is, with proximity. Next question, how much security is needed? This may vary, so we need another free input. It is called set coal in control theory. I have proposed to call it dependency. John Bowlby was not amused about this choice of words since learning theorists such as Sears had loaded this term with unfortunate connotations. Mary Ainsworth was less inhibited. She wrote, Now, as to terminology, I think that I would opt to keep dependency. I know that John feels that this term has accumulated so many connotations that it is no longer useful. But, as I said before, I think that perhaps the way you use it is the right way, and the connotations therefore might well be useful. And generally, I consider that systems theory defines its terms so exactly that misunderstandings need not be feared. Security and dependency are being compared. A comparison is a subtraction. The resulting difference 
must somehow determine what we have called the momentum P. If dependency exceeds security, there will be an appetence for security, in the opposite case, an aversion. A final question pertains to the effect of the momentum P on the subject's momentary location. P is proportional to the frequency in which the fins are beating, that is, to the current velocity of locomotion. You have to sum up, or in mathematical terms, to integrate velocities over time in order to derive location. So far, the description is still too simple since it proceeds from the presupposition that the fish move in a one-dimensional space. Actually, however, we are dealing with at least two dimensions and here things get a little bit more complicated. The location of subject and object can no longer be described by a single scalar number. We need two coordinates. These can also be regarded as components of a position vector, which is sort of a light beam pointing from the origin towards the fish. The location of the object can be described in the same manner. Vectors too can be subtracted from each other yielding a new vector that denotes the object's position from the subject's perspective. Again, we need two numbers to describe this vector. Instead of Cartesian coordinates, we had better use polar coordinates here. One number for the distance, a second one for the directional angle, measured with respect to some reference, like the animal's longitudinal axis. Now let's apply this to our control diagram. Vectorial variables shall be dis distinguished by double arrows. The locations of subject and object are position vectors. So is their difference, which means that it contains not only information about distance, but also about direction. The resulting security, however, is one-dimensional, a scalar. How do you transform a vector into a scalar? This seems easy. Security is only dependent on distance. We can simply ignore the directional information. The difficulty emerges a little later, however. Security and dependency are scalars, and so is their difference. Let's call it activation. The momentum P, however, must be a vector. So how do we turn scalar activation into vectorial momentum? We are clearly missing one dimension here. We cannot ditch directional information after all. Somehow it must enter into P. But of course, activation as well must somehow determine P. And the only way a scalar can contribute to a vector is by way of the multiplication. So here is another iconic symbol we need in our graphics. Now we still have to interpret the semantics of this vectorial efference. Its directional information is clear, but what about its magnitude? Could we neglect distance altogether and regard the output as a unit vector? No, this does not work. Distance must be influential, somehow. Since the magnitude of this vector is obviously bound to vanish as soon as the other fish is too far away to be visible. This idea can be further elaborated. The object, after all, is only interesting 
if it is recognized as a conspecific. And the chance herefore decreases continuously with distance, although for the time being we don't yet know according to what function. What name should we give to this vector? Here the term incentive from Hollyan psychology comes to mind. This construct is again two-dimensional with the components direction and strength. Direction is trivial. The tricky question is how to quantify incentive strength. So we come up with two sensory quantities which are yet to be determined. How can we manage to do that? Well, the trick is we have to find a way to wiggle the set goal. In order to do so, let's look at the empirical data. This is the distance distribution between two free-swimming fish. Free-swimming means that none of them is confined in a bowl. The curve is based on some ten thousands of data, so it is quite smooth already. But it is still wiggling too much to differentiate it, so we have to smooth it out, since we need its derivative to compute the momentum p. The water was kept at the optimal temperature of 28 centigrade. If this parameter is changed, it turns out that the animals move closer together. It appears to be a plausible hypothesis that the animals feel uneasy in the non-optimal temperature and seek more security. In other words, that the temperature acts selectively on the set goal. If P equals the product of incentive and activation, and if activation is the difference of dependency and security, then we can make the following proposition. Let dependency at a particular temperature have a certain magnitude, which we symbolize by red color. Accordingly, P is also temperature specific. At a different temperature, another momentum P results. If we now subtract the two p-curves from each other, security is cancelled out, and since the two dependencies are constant values, so is their difference. Which means, apart from a proportionality factor, the difference of two p-curves yields the characteristic of the incentive detector. Of course, this reasoning is based on the assumption that indeed the temperature affects primarily the set goal, but this can be controlled by examining whether the result is the same if we perform the computation for a different pair of temperatures. After all, we have measured the distance distribution under three temperature conditions. And regardless which two sets of data we pair, they should always yield the same incentive characteristic. Indeed, they match perfectly enough that the remaining deviations can be regarded as second-order effects. Now what about the characteristic of the security detector? Let's first reshuffle the equation a little. Among the quantities on, on its left side, the incentive strength has just been determined. We can insert it into the equation. P, the momentum, we know already. Dependency being a set goal should not vary with distance and can therefore be taken as a constant. So we are even in a position to compute how security varies with distance. Here is what this looks like. 
Both characteristics allow for a plausible interpretation. Let's assume the subject views a partner. This is the retinal image. If the distance is doubled, the retinal image shrinks to a quarter. So the perspective size is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And since it determines the recognizability of the object, it qualifies as a sensible measure of incentive strength. And indeed, if adequately calibrated, it allows for a fair approximation of the empirical characteristic. The simplest proposition for the characteristic of the security detector looks like that, an upper and a lower limit, and in between simply a linear decay. This too makes sense from an, from an adaptational standpoint. Security ought to decrease proportionally with the time required to swim to the partner. So here is the result of the quantitative systems analysis. I hasten to admit that I skipped a few corollary assumptions that remain to be clarified in additional experiments in order to make the reasoning airtight. But my main concern was to present the gist of the methodology that is basically capable to elaborate well-founded hypotheses on motivational structure from a mere recording of proxemic behavior. While I am at it, there is still another issue providing food for thought. The mathematical formulas which we came up with appear to be rather nifty and elegant. Everything makes perfect sense. Does that mean that eventually the dream came true, which was once cherished by Clark Hull and heralded by Kurt Levin as the program of a transition to a Galilean mode of thinking in psychology? It most certainly does not, and the analysis just performed may help to clarify this issue. It is the ideal of an exact science to couch nature's secret in a meaningful formalism. The problem is, however, when probing into this secret, we don't get to behold clear and precise contours, but rather some blurred image that could not taken at face value be described in a clear and simple formula. But since the times of Galileo, physicists are unwaveringly convinced that natural order is perfect and can therefore validly be described by an elegant mathematical expression, whereas the blurring is only an artifact due to the limitations of perception and to our imperfect experimental methods. Consequently, two steps seem to be required. Firstly, to refine our methods, particularly to transcend from mere anecdotal observation to sophisticated experimentation in the laboratory using expensive machinery. And secondly, to regard empirical raw data as imperfect manifestations of a flawless truth lying behind them and the heuristic guideline proving most helpful in this enterprise was, interestingly enough, to entrust oneself to the aesthetic sense. According to Richard Feynman, who once remarked that you can recognize truth by its beauty and simplicity. The dominant heuristic principle of modern physics, beyond any doubt, is symmetry. And here is where the banana skin lies. It was a secular error of psychology when it tried to emulate physics in this respect. Little did we understand that physics is not the only prototype of natural science. There exists a second one, in many respects antipodal to physics, and this is biology. Or viewed 
in a more generic perspective, there are sciences of substance and sciences of structure. Biology does not deal with the essence of matter and energy. It deals with its arrangement. It investigates the permanent forms in which matter and energy are channeled and metabolically exchanged. And its heuristics is not intrinsic beauty, but external adaptation. Adaptive order, too, has its mathematics, as we have seen. But formalisms have a different meaning here. They do not describe a reality behind the appearance, a really existing world that we only perceive in a blurred fashion, but rather it describes an adaptive asymptote that nature itself only reaches approximately, by way of mutation and selection. So the problem does not lie in our methods, which are fair enough in most cases. Particularly, we cannot hope that a more and more sophisticated technology will lead us to a better, simpler and clearer understanding of some hidden secret of organismic order. We have to acknowledge that the simplicity and transparency of the formalism resulting from our analysis is not a reconstruction, but rather an idealization of reality. This is what Kurt Levin was never ready to accept. He has also liked toying with dynamic concepts. He talked about the attractive force of a target and stipulated it to be inversely proportional to the target's distance. And not long ago, psychologists were mighty proud about having such a little Newton in our community. But when we ask how Levine arrived at this formula, we become aware that he simply dreamt up an expression that sounded simple and elegant and hoped to God that the beauty and simplicity of such a proposition would prove it to be a step in the right direction. Unfortunately, in biology, truth is not so simple. Even in physics, we have to distinguish two different ways in which attraction may depend on distance. One of them is the elastic tension of a spring. It decreases with proximity. The alternative is magnetic force. Here, attraction grows with proximity. Levin opted for the magnetic kind of attraction, simply because Newton had interpreted gravity this way. But is this a sensible guess in the case of affiliative behavior? For what purpose do we search the proximity of a partner? If what we want is security, then the uneasiness should grow with distance, so attachment should instead function like a spring. On second glance, however, this cannot be true either. There is this story of Buridan's donkey starving to death between two hay heaps that attract him equally strongly. This is what would happen if the attractive force were of the spring type. An infant between mum and daddy who walk on opposite sides of the street would remain in the middle of the roadway. So there must exist a magnetic force, after all, which renders the central equilibrium unstable and allows the donkey to happily survive eating one heap after the other and the child to choose one of the parents as a secure base. So we can see that the question of attraction type requires a more sophisticated answer. Let's for the last time return to our fish model. The momentum P depends on distance over two ways. First, via the incentive strength according to a magnetic-like force. And second, via activation, which increases with insecurity. Insecurity, however, grows with distance, so activation follows the spring type of attraction. 
Levin, believing in the beauty of simplicity, made do with the incentive component. But if we think in terms of adaptation, we are led to a more comprehensive description. Security decreases with distance, so activation being the inverse of security should behave the opposite way. Incentive decreases with distance. Therefore, the momentum P, being the product of both, ought to have a non-monotonic course. When approaching its companion, the fish should start slowly, swim quickly in the middle, and slow down at the end of its journey. We did not check this with fish, but back in 1970, it came out in an experiment with greylack geese at the working place of Conrad Lorenz. Here you see a gosling imprinted to a human caregiver, running towards his foster mother. If you can recognize the beak, you will see that it permanently weeps until it is reunited with mother where it relaxes and sits down. This was the experimental setting viewed from above. A large round sand arena, the box in the middle, the position of the, uh, of the reference person varied in two distances. The recording was performed by way of two film cameras synchronized to take a picture every half second and later evaluated by hand. It was the pre-video era. But we already had a computer with 8 kilobyte core storage, which we could use to reconstruct the running trail. This is a recording of a trail directed towards the imprinting object. The diameters of the squares equal the momentary speed and as we can see, the gosling runs just as expected in view of our considerations about the momentum P. Incidentally, we did the experiment also in the absence of the imprinting object with another human whom the bird only knew from sight, a stranger in terms of attachment theory. Here again we notice an approaching intention, but the running speed is reduced, the final distance is larger, the animal remains uneasy, it shudders and shows intention to leave. This is the recorded behavior towards the stranger. The approach is slower, the resting distance is uh, on a locus with a larger diameter and the terminal unrest remains on a higher level. Attentive observers may notice that the upper path is shorter than the lower one. Unfortunately, our experiment was brought to an untimely end due to a bad weather period that flooded our arena before we could record the response to the stranger under the long distance condition, but I think the data recorded are nevertheless informative. At any rate, the model was already sufficiently elaborate to predict these behaviors in a qualitatively correct fashion. Well, so much for giving you an idea of the quantitative handling of the Zurich model. From now on, we shall take it easy and confine ourselves to a still formalized but more qualitative description of the causal interactions which must be postulated in order to understand attachment.